I mentioned last week that with this liturgical year, we are focusing on Matthew, and we will discover that this gospel will give us a different perspective and is quite different from the others. This becomes obviously apparent when we go looking for the Christmas story, which we will discover is told in Matthew in just eight verses. With no journey to Bethlehem, no stable, no swaddling claws, no manger, no sheep, no shepherds, not even a heavenly host singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Matthew's account of Jesus' birth is amazingly sparse, and it doesn't give very much in which to build a Christmas pageant. But before we get to that story, remember some of those really important themes I mentioned last week in Matthew's Gospel? For this author, the gospel, this, the author of this gospel, mission is of paramount importance. We're told to get out there, doing God's work in our world, and bringing transformative change. Matthew points out, our mission, our work is for the whole world, and yet, this universal focus on everyone begins in our own backyard, in our own neighborhoods, as we take on the critical issues right in our own community at 4th Street, right outside our doors in our neighborhood, right wherever we find them where we're living. And Matthew makes very clear, real people and real problems are messy, and to make any difference in the world, we can't run from the messiness of life. In fact, we have to head right toward the messiness and jump right on in. You see, God has a mission for the world, and it's kind of laid out in the 146th Psalm that we heard a bit ago. We hear a bit of that vision, justice for the oppressed, food for the hungry, people set free from the many things that hold us captive, eyes open to newness of life, those bent low under the strains and stresses of life lifted up, a love for justice, care and support for strangers, orphans, widows, ruin for the ways of evil. Then in Matthew, we see God yet again starting to move in history, to give shape and form to this holy vision for the world. And where does God show up this time? In a young woman who is engaged to be married then discovers she's pregnant, but her fiancé is not the father to be. And a righteous, compassionate man who is engaged to be married then finds out his fiancé is pregnant and he has had nothing to do with this in a relationship, about to be broken apart because neither Joseph nor Mary can comprehend what is going on here. In two people, facing an unplanned and surprising pregnancy, asked to believe something that makes no sense, receiving a promise that is unbelievable, encouraged to partner with God in bringing God's love to the world in new, unimaginable ways. Now, if you were going to take God's vision, God's message, God's mission to all the world, how many of you would come up with this kind of a strategic plan? Show of hands? Anyone? Okay. The way that God is moving in the world here, coming up with this plan, is rather absurd, to be sure. Doesn't make any sense. The way God is moving the world sounds pretty foolish doesn't it? So what would you do? How would you plan this mission? Whom would you consult? What would you do to change the world? Where would you go looking for God's help, seeking the Spirit to guide you, trying to find the path for walking with Jesus on our world the way it is today? In an old book by Lois Cheney called, Who Do You Think You're Kidding? God is No Fool. The author writes a meditation for those who are despairing the circumstances of life and seeking to find God in new ways. She writes, Once, friends seemed far away and those who were near seemed unfeeling and uncaring. The job to which I was committed seemed to set off my weakness in sharp relief. The values, which so recently had seemed dazzling, now appeared upon closer inspection tarnished and meaningless. The world in which I live lay deep in its own mire of deceit. My eyes swept life as I knew it, in bottomless disappointment. And so I rejected it. I decided to turn my back on this futile world and
and try to find life's meaning elsewhere. I stepped outside the world's fence and vowed to be blind to it for as long as I would live. I went looking for God. I wandered and I searched. I prayed and meditated. Unencumbered with the pulls and pains of my own world, I felt light and free. I searched for my God. I grew apprehensive and doubt seeped in, for I could not find God. Then I glanced over the fence I had so firmly rejected. I saw again the futile, faithless world. And there, deep in the midst of the pain, stood God, talking, listening, holding a dying child in God's arms. God looked at me. I saw that to find God, to get close to God, I would have to re-enter the world. I found so worthless. I'd have to make my way through all I'd rejected if I were to meet my God. I felt deep anguish as I stood by the fence. God's eyes were upon me, and God saw my heavy heart, and God's eyes never left me. Where will Fort Street find the right strategy to build up this faith community into a bigger, stronger membership? Where will Fort Street discover the work God has for us as we are called to bring transformative change into our world? Where will Fort Street find God in the way we need God in this time and in this place? There was a time when a big issue outside our doors in the larger community was multiple and overwhelming needs of the homeless. Fort Street responded to meet that need, and this outreach grew and grew and grew some more, becoming a large part of Fort Street's reputation and identity to this very day in the community, in the presbytery, in the denomination. This need still exists, and we will continue to respond, but now we live in a new day requiring of us also some new responses to address some other needs. As I've tried to be attuned to the leading of the Spirit, as I've watched what is happening in this church, as I've met new people and learned about organizations near us and many of the needs around us, as I've talked to people at the national level of our denomination, as I've heard the passionate interests of some of our members, and as I believe into what God is doing here at Fort Street, every single time we take even one small step in one direction I believe God is calling this church, I am being drawn into, actually I'm being grasped by what I believe is God's vision for Fort Street in the beginning of the 21st century. Now, perhaps confession is in order here. Some of you may know this about me, many of you probably do not. I am a skeptic. I am a self-avowed, practicing skeptic, a real questioner. I do not quickly believe much of anything. I seldom rush into new things, at least if they're important, without a time of discernment, without sorting through many things, without struggling and wrestling with a lot of yes, buts, and what ifs, looking at things from many different angles, talking with a variety of people, and anticipating every problem I could possibly think of. So when God is trying to tell me something, we often struggle together for quite a while. Wrestling with, with each other, I think that's in the Bible somewhere, isn't it? It's an evolving process that might go something like this. Well, I don't know. Don't you see the problems with this? Some people aren't going to like it. I'm not even sure I want to do this. I don't know even for sure if I agree. Maybe this is just something I thought of, something that popped into my mind for whatever reason, a figment of my imagination. So God, you are going to have to show me more, okay? Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. As my thinking and believing and discovering have evolved over the past several months, as I've wondered and thought and prayed and questioned about what is needed to move Ford Street into a hopeful, healthy, faithful future, I've come to believe our efforts and energies do need to be focused on the Rivella Center, 
on the Catherine Ferguson Academy at Audio International Students at Wayne State University. Now, if you're going to revitalize a congregation, if you're going to focus on the future, if you're set on changing the world, does it really make any sense to begin with infants, like little Tessa, completely dependent on others for her very survival? Is there really any wisdom in pinning our hopes on young people who have been thrown out of their families just for being who God has created them to be? Can young students from other countries, often with limited financial resources, struggling just to make it in our culture, or maybe even to understand the ways of our culture, including the church, teach us vital things that we need to know? Are we really likely to find new energy? to discover God in new ways, to see our own spiritual lives grow, through our interactions with a young, unmarried girl, still much of a child herself, who was pregnant, about to have a child, perhaps confused, afraid, and with very few resources. No, probably not. It just doesn't make any sense. Maybe it's just a figment of my imagination. But then again, isn't that what God did? Isn't this pretty much how God brought new hope, new life, love incarnate into the world, love that we could see and touch, feel and hear as we come to believe and to hope and to live? Will you pray with me? Jesus, Emmanuel, love incarnate. We go looking for you in all the wrong places, still not hearing your message to us, still not following the Christ child, still wandering, unable to see your vision for us that will lead us into our future and our home. Emmanuel, God with us, help us to seek you and to find you in the ones who may seem like the least of these, but who have the richest gifts to offer us. We pray in the spirit of Jesus, that Christ child still in our midst, even today. Amen. <laughs>